Hello and welcome everybody. This is the first in our series of DIN um, podcasts, specifically on people and culture. And in the podcast series, we want to bring to you insights, inspiration, innovation from within the social housing sector, but also, of course, from out the social side of the social housing sector. And today we're going to go outside um, and we're going to be talking to Mark Bradley from the Fan Experience Company. Um, so we're going to get curious about what we can learn from what sports clubs, big and small, um, from the UK and also across Europe do to create an exceptional fan experience um, and also how they work with their colleagues to create the right environment to enable that experience to be delivered so it's great to great to see you Mark thank you for joining nice. us today nice to see you Hannah looking forward to it great and can I start by asking you a little bit more about the fan experience and, and why you set it up I think back in 2005 that's right yeah yeah, so obviously we have a mutual interest in service excellence and we met when uh, both involved in the Unisys Management Today Service Excellence Awards. We did, we did. When you were leading Bromford Housing into battle with, uh, with some <laughs> enormous global organisations. Um, we were, We all got yeah. to find out about you. Um, I, at the time, was working for a retail bank. Uh, after that, I joined a customer service uh, consultancy and um, I wrote a book in 2004 called Inconvenience Stores, which was about my family's actual 12 months in 2003, just going about our day and being interrupted with people providing bad service left, right and centre. Um, and um, the the one thing we kind of picked up about that was how powerful it is to walk in the customer's footsteps. Bit of a cliche, but actually when someone senior in an organisation gets a glimpse of what it's really like, they're usually, one, horrified, and two, galvanised into instant action. And we thought, that's yeah. quite an interesting tool. I wonder if there's I wonder if there's something in that kind of substantially that, that might support a business. And uh, through a series of weird left turns, we ended up actually doing it in uh, football and obviously okay. in, in other sports. So what we do, we... Uh, we um, provide a number of services and support primarily to the football industry, but to some other sports as well, to help them understand and apply engagement within the fan experience so that um, levels of value increase among the fan base and the local community and the club then has uh, sustainable growth. You know, however well it does on the pitch, it knows that its fans are fully emotionally connected and feel feel that that's reciprocated so it's very difficult to put it into one phrase but it's effectively what you and I know as service excellence in any other organization yeah and that fan is, is just a different angle to it I guess absolutely and, and yeah yeah Mark you know a little bit about the social housing sector so we you know we we go way back and I know you've done a little bit of work in the social housing sector so what do you think that um you know a fan is very different to what you might yeah. see as a, as, as a tenant which we would consider a customer in social housing what do you see as um any similarities between the two well it's it's exactly that that it's a non-traditional customer you know uh, supplier relationship and where yeah terminology like customer engagement and service excellence don't initially easily fit you know because if mm. you look at choice as a as an example obviously you know choice is lessened in 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 your in your industry and it's also lessened emotionally in 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 the football industry for example you know that i'm i'm a I'm, why am i a sunderland supporter for my sins i'm i'm wearing an argentina top because they win things um, it's, it's, it's because my dad was the only Sunderland fan in his class at school in concert in County Durham. And, um, it wasn't because Sunderland were winning things. I ended up supporting them according to my mother, because I felt so sorry for him that his team lost all the time. So it was a kind of a father son bonding exercise. There's no rationality in that. And that kind of, that, that is, is, is helped me understand how you, um, define uh, well, customer engagement in football, which is fan engagement. It's a term you hear a lot. No one ever thinks about defining it, which obviously okay. creates problems. But, you know, this is where I think we're both very, very similarly connected in our provider, if you like, um, customer relationships is that um, I was asked to create the world's first physical and online fan engagement certificate, study certificate for uh, FC Barcelona's Innovation Hub. It's like a, a university that they have. And I came up with the phrase, 
It's everything we do to understand, protect, and to grow the supporters' emotional investment in the club, national team, whatever it is. So for me, it is all about emotional investment. Now, most people will tell you that engagement uh, in academic terms is to do with the sum of the uh, tangible and intangible transactions. So it's not just the fact they buy from you and um, talk to you and engage with you. It's about the emotional yeah. connection too. But actually, I think in football, it is all about the emotional connection and, and, and you know, less, less about the actual behaviors, the emotional thing comes first. And I think with, with, with housing, I always remember when I first met you and hearing some of the insights into the things you did to make people feel proud, to make people feel, you know, not that they were just being given shelter, but they were actually in a relationship where they could expect to be looked after, where you'd be proactive about checking on, you know, quality of um, the, the accommodation and, and things like that. So it does it does make for a, an interesting experience. You know, if you walk into a football club and talk about customer engagement, um, you'll find people saying, Shh, don't use that word. Fans don't want to be called customers. Okay. They, they don't, but they do want to be treated like customers. And I think okay. sometimes when I first worked in football 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago now, there was a sense that senior people in the sport were really concerned about using customer concepts to apply to um, football and of course where that's led is um, and we can perhaps talk about this is what I learned from our time together looking at you know service excellence as a concept and how easy or actually how difficult it was to overlay those strategic you know elements like vision values and leadership and people and culture and service delivery and customer intelligence into a world where at one of the first games we assessed, and we'll talk about that, um, there was a crowd of about 18,000, but only two functioning women's toilets in the main stand. You know, So it's kind yeah. of, <laughs> let's just put concepts of strategic service, service excellence to one side and fix the toilets for women. Yeah, you know? yeah. So it's, it's, it's been an interesting journey. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And the other thing that strikes me as well is sometimes that in, um, question of choice. I don't think fans you know, have a choice. They, they are, you know, as you say, totally mm. aligned to that club. It's not, I don't like this one. I'll go and pick that one. Yeah. Um, and, and and similar to social housing uh, customers and tenants, they, they can't yeah. just go and find another provider. But the choice, the choice is, I think sometimes people think that choice is only in, in, in the context of deciding to support the club or not supporting the club. Mm. But actually you've got a spectrum of behaviors that fans will exhibit according to how valued they feel. Now, you know, we, we could get into some complex discussions here, but net promoter, which is a concept that we're all very familiar with, doesn't work perfectly in football because if you ask an existing fan of a club how strongly he or she is likely to recommend coming to games to someone who isn't a fan, there's always going to be a residual pride that means that that net promoter score is probably actually overinflated to what it actually okay. is. Yeah. So we we did a, an exercise with a, with a club that was that was actually dropping from the third to the fourth tier around a decade ago, where we surveyed fans every quarter. And instead of just asking the net promoter score, we also asked on a scale of one to 10 to match net promoter. There's no scientific basis for doing this, but we thought somebody's got to try and figure out how we can do this for, a, for an emotionally driven kind of customer supply relationship. And we came up with the idea of just having a net value score. So the question was on a one to 10 scale, how personally valued do you feel by the club? Because that's the reciprocation of the emotional investment. And it was interesting that even when the club got relegated at the start of that period, the net promoter score was still a plus one, but the yeah. actual net value score so invented <laughs> was minus 67. So when we addressed the particular issues that were, that were behind that, and in a year's time, the club got promoted back to where it was, net promoter had, had moved up about 15 points but we now actually had the net value score in a positive score only just but in a positive score so that 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 was you know it was a non-scientific experiment you know i couldn't uh, tell you whether some respondents answered you know two or three different surveys it we probably wouldn't stand academic um scrutiny but at the same time it actually told me an awful lot about that that club fan relationship and if you can understand the root of that emotional connection and then serve it 
Now, obviously, the things that you need to do is to have great data. You need to be listening to your fans. You need to have a strong value set. You need to, you know, have a culture of engagement. And these are the things that the sport has struggled with. And, mm. um, and you know, we, we've tried to play this role over the last couple of decades. Uh, and, and we can talk about this. But actually, right now, um, things have never been better, if I speak selfishly, for our organisation, because the political status is such that the government is 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 talking about bringing in a football regulator. Interesting, because we know all about regulation in, in social housing. But um, so, so let me ask you about how do you go about identifying sort of the problems and challenges that with the clubs that you that you work? Well, what we do, we, we, we are known primarily for our um, fan experience assessments and for the um, for the professional person, what that means is a qualitative snapshot. And it's it came from this original idea all those years ago when I wrote the book, which was, why don't we just tell the story? Why don't we just ask the fan to tell the story uh, of their experience? And back in 2006, we used families. We thought families were a really good, um, a really good group because if if a club can engage a family and especially kids at the age of seven or eight, I've not just got one fan, but potentially three or four fans who are going to be lifetime fans. Um, so we did a, an experience where we had real families. Uh, well, first of all, me, my other half, Anna, and our two kids that would have been 10 or seven at the time, 10 and seven at the time. We visited 30 consecutive EFL football games <laughs> during one season. So um, I was jo at the end of this season, you know, Anna was speaking to me through a firm of solicitors because she's not much <laughs> a football fan, but she did have that objective eye. She could see straight away why people yeah. weren't taking their kids to football. You know, I, I couldn't see it as clearly because it's like, get out the way. I'm, I'm looking for my pie, you know, just yeah. step over these children. Um, and <laughs> what came out of that was the family excellence scheme. Uh, and so, and I, I will fully answer your question, but what that did was uh, we we have over the intervening 18 seasons developed a, a very, very talented team of assessors who were able to inhabit that family, walk the steps through the touch points, which obviously range from the website, the travel guidance, the last mile, social media, ticket purchase, um, view, comfort, um, uh, hygiene, um, the people element, the refreshments, retail, what happens before the match, what happens after the match, even right down to your feedback survey and your drive, you know, or your bus home. And um, that, in doing that, and in doing it for 18 years now with this particular uh, client at the EFL, um, has had a massive commercial impact. So the three seasons before we started, junior season ticket sales were flat, around 0.5%. In 10 seasons after we began this scheme where clubs get two visits every year, they get the feedback, they get other support, there's a reward in it, there's a family club of the year, there's family excellence status to be achieved. We went from 0.5% to 45%. Wow. So the clubs, the clubs were really using that data. But the point that I was trying to get across was, and to answer your original question, is that when you have a, a, a significant or a substantial interaction with an organisation, you can, and I guess it's, you know, especially you and me with our service excellence backgrounds, you can make a pretty accurate estimation of what the culture of that organization is, or at least what priority customer engagement has in that organization. And I think what we were, what we were basically saying to football back in 2005, 2006 was that it's not important enough to you and it needs to be more important. So if we can provide these qualitative snapshots that kind of work as uh, have a catalytic effect that get people to at least sit up and talk about it and some of the things that happened you know within six months of that program starting uh, Cardiff City installed some automatic lights into their uh, automatic turnstiles at the new uh, what was then the new Cardiff City Stadium so that if an existing family already on the database came in and it was one of the children's birthdays these three red lights would flash on the inside of the turnstile addressing the uh, calling um grabbing the attention of the family liaison volunteer who would then greet the family find out whose birthday right. it was congratulate them give them a goodie bag sit them in the dugout during the pre-match warm-up take them to visit the manager uh take them on a tour of the stadium and guess what that family would come back the next day and that club went from 459 registered fam uh, season ticket holders in the family stand in 2007 i think it was 
to seven and a half thousand four seasons later. So I don't know what that is in percentage terms, but that is exponential growth. And that was yeah. that was purely because the um, introduction or the intervention, this this is what it was like for this one family. The club used that as a catalyst, not just to improve that, but to think differently about how they dealt with families overall. Yeah. So you know that 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 was what was happening back then. I bet that had a really good feel good factor for the colleagues as well that were involved in Absolutely. doing that. It's and lovely to do good things for people, isn't it? You know, it, so it is, and it's it's always been it's always been a struggle in football. There's always a culture of let's just get the next, let's just get the next to the next game and let's get that game delivered uh, and you know there's very little breathing space or reflection in 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 football of course there isn't the the more well reserved uh resourced clubs where they'll have uh, someone looking after people in the club they'll have a people strategy but the vast majority of clubs you know even even you know professional clubs even some elite professional clubs are still very far away from what you and i would would um describe as a as a as a very strong people strategy yeah and and building on that mark i mean that's a great example of something quite quite specific and i'm really curious about those sort of things so have you worked with clubs where they've done exceptional things for fan experience or even even kind of small things like that that had exceptional impact i'd love to know a bit more about any of the examples that yeah you well let me let me give you a couple yeah. of examples um one club I'm very fond of is is Middlesbrough. I mean, you might think not being a Sunderland fan, you know, they're they're kind of they're not the main enemy, but they're kind of you know that'll sit well with the founder of Dean. I think he is a Middlesbrough fan. So. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> Middlesbrough were the first club who invited us, me to work with, you know, with them on a consultancy basis, and um, this family excellence scheme with the EFL. You you achieve you achieve status. We don't use the word standard because the media would pick up on it and think if a club doesn't get the standard, they're not safe for kids. You uh, have to be so careful, like yeah. you do in your sector. It's a sector that makes the slightest mistake. The media are all over it. it has lots of successes. The media aren't interested. <laughs> so we had to be careful with the wording. But what happened at Middlesbrough was that um, they were doing okay, but they lost their status in around two thousand and twelve. And that loss of family excellence status, it, it wasn't a poor experience by any way, but it just wasn't, there weren't enough signs of excellence when when we, when we our assessors visited. They decided, they kind of took it to heart and they said, right, we can control this. We can't control what happens on the pitch, but we can control what happens off the pitch. So we're going to show him, you know? And within a year, they'd gone from not having the status to being family club of the year. And what they did, let me just tell you one element of what they did. And anyone interested in uh, service excellence and sport should should really, you know, if they haven't been, especially if they haven't been, what will happen with a with a first time family is that they'll contact the club. They're encouraged to telephone the club if they're bringing kids to their first game, mm -hmm. which allows the club then to ring them two or three days before the game after they've got the tickets and say, um, we want to. We've got a surprise for you on Saturday. We'd like you to arrive a couple of hours before the game takes place. We've got surprises for the kids. Kids will get a goodie bag, a tour of the stadium, a couple of surprises, probably meet a player. They'll get to parade around the pitch 10 minutes before kickoff with flags. And if they're on the spectrum, then they do that half an hour earlier when the stadium's empty. So, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a kid okay. is, um, you know, on the spectrum might not be so, um, uh, you know, frightened by it. Um, and then... Lots of great things happen in the family stand. There's some, you know, the amazing experience there. But then when you're driving home, and this has happened to all of our assessors, there's a phone call from the same person who rang them before the game, who met them at the stadium to say, well, how was it? How did your kids enjoy their first trip to the Riverside? Now that is outstanding. The, the fact that we've gone in football from not caring at all and not even having a database to know who's in the stadium to clubs who are able to, get on top of an individual family's journey. And you might think, well, why would you do that? But the power of that family thing is that, and what we're saying to the clubs is, you know, think about all the other groups that you deal with. And, you know, and we've done projects for women going to men's football, fans with a variety of disabilities and special needs going to games, away fan specific programs, season ticket holders, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, great. And there's lots packed in there about... Um... Mm -hmm. Clubs responding to diversity there, you know, yeah. you mentioned um, as well, which is which is really helpful, Mark. And what strikes me as well, and, and you know, particularly with things like the AI agenda um, having an impact in businesses and, um, you know, people concerned about, well, if that takes up um, off some of the more kind of 
admin tasks that we do. But what this is a great example of is when you can free people up to spend the time building yeah. relationships, interacting, being mm. themselves, showing a bit of themselves in their interactions with customers, fans, yeah. or, or, you know, how powerful, how just how absolutely powerful it, that is and that personal touch. And, and I should also say that, you know, when we come across these here to help teams and match day ambassador teams, they're generally not full-time employees of the clubs. They're, they're often fans. They're often volunteers. Um, but they're very rarely club employees, which, you know, mm. which is which is interesting. But I think that just tells you that most clubs are, are, are pretty much pared down once you get outside of the, you know, the the championship and, and you get down to clubs below yeah. that. They don't have that. They don't have that stretch in the in the kind of the the, the team there that people can do that, because to be honest, most of them will be working in a specific role on a match day. And that's yeah. a challenge for football because you're going to buy your. You're going to buy your, I don't know, falafel wrap from someone who works for a third party supplier. The steward is from a third party supplier. You know, you might even get a shop that's run by the brand that's on the shirt rather than the club. So, you know, yeah. football doesn't really control a lot of the key touch points, which is, again, a, um, it, I think there's a, a, a resemblance to what you do as well, because a lot of what the resident, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a experiences is 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 outside be, of your control. Yeah, it could be a repair contractor. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, but it's perceived to be delivered by you. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 where was I the other day? Oh, yeah, we, we landed at Manchester Airport. There's always something wrong when you land at Manchester Airport. Um, you know, and it's always depressing because you come from Europe where everything's great and you come back to this country and everything's falling apart. And uh, we we got to the bottom of the steps having disembarked from the plane, but couldn't actually walk up the steps into the building because as it turned out there'd been an evacuation which of course can't be helped first member of staff walked past we said what's going on i i don't know i don't work here second one uh what's going on there's been in a um, there's been a suspect package which is being dealt with uh so we've been asked to evacuate that area of the airport so can you tell us how long it'll be i don't work here i've got no idea so the first the first three people we spoke all said I don't work here. They were all wearing uniforms of some description. Of course, they were all working for different parts of the, yeah. the experience that for customers is Manchester Airport. But because they're not direct employees of the airport, they were basically absolving yeah. themselves from any responsibility for us, which led to us thinking, well, this is just awful, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so... Mark, I'm when we get into the second hour of the podcast, we can go. Into <laughs> I'm sure we'll have a round two. Mark, thanks yeah. so much for sharing your insights um, today. It's been a, a real pleasure and, and there is so much more. But I think the one thing that really stands out for me is how do we really leverage an emotional, genuine, authentic, yeah. emotional connection with people to make a difference? So thank you. Thank you so much. I really, no, really no, appreciate it's, it. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Helena. Thanks again. Thank you.